officially afternoon. Um, I'm Jill Erickson. I'm head of reference and adult services here at the Falmouth Public Library. And I am so delighted to see so many of you here this afternoon. We are very excited ourselves as well. I have no doubt you are excited. And so we will get quickly through the introduction. Elizabeth Berg is the best-selling author of more than 30 books. And we are so thrilled to have her here with us this afternoon. This event is part of her New England library tour. A special thanks to our wonderful friends for making this event possible, including the Library Board of Trustees, Eight Cousins Books, FCTV, our staff, and our wonderful patron who brought Elizabeth's tour to our attention. We could have not done it without all of you. Please, no flash photography this afternoon. And I do want to show you the emergency exit, which is to my right. You will never normally have to go through that door. And we have every reason to believe you will not need to go through there this today. The actual door, of course, is over there. And that pantry door also goes. And let us not forget, we have windows as well. Uh, so with that all being said, <laughs> We will lighten the mood here, and we welcome with big hearts and a big round of applause, Elizabeth Berg. Thank you very much, and thanks for coming out at lunch hour. I like when things happen soon because it justifies my getting a very big lunch after <laughs> the ordinary time. Um, did anybody else have a fantasy of climbing out the window? <laughs> That's what I, th I thought. I'm going for the window, because everybody else will go for the door. I'm going right there. So we have to leave. That's my window. I, I want to thank the library for inviting me here to this beautiful community and to them for supplying the flowers that you see everywhere and, and the wonderful treats. It's always um, a great pleasure for me to do readings, but I like it even better when the audience is so well treated. You know, you come and you see flowers and you get treats. So thank you very much for doing that. I also want to thank my partner, Bill Young, who's lurking over there, who did everything in terms of organizing this tour. Um, I just sent out a a plea <laughs> on Facebook. If you want us to come, let us know. And and there was a patron here. Is is he or she here? The person you? It was you. Thank you. Thank you. So. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you very much for doing that. It's like matchmaking, right? It's great. Yeah. <laughs> So um, this is ostensibly the Still Happy Tour. Um, I, wrote, I did a self-published book of Facebook postings called Make Someone Happy. And then um, and I did it because people on Facebook said, you ought to make a book out of these. And it, when the first one came in, I thought, mm, I'm not going to do that. And then a few more people asked. And I said, OK. So that's um, what Make Someone Happy was. And we did a tour for that in the Midwest. Now we're doing it for Still Happy, which includes the very famous book of Homer, who was my golden retriever. And um, this coincides with the paperback release of the story of Arthur True Love, which was my last novel from Random House. So I thought we'd have adult story time. And I'll read you just a brief something from each of those three titles, all of which are for sale in the, in the room that looks like where the mafia meets back there. It's very elegant and sort of dark. And you feel like you're getting away with something in there. So that's where the books are. The treat's out there, too. Um, if there's time and interest, I will read you a very short snippet of the next book, a sneak peek of what is called Night of Miracles. That book is a kind of sequel to the story of Arthur True Love. I want to give a shout out to the men in the audience because, as you can see, not that many men come to my reading. So thank you. You can be, you can be first in the cookie line. All right. 
Also, I want to, I think all of you know that Eight Cousins is the, the bookseller here today, and I want to stress, as if you didn't know, how very important it is to support your local bookseller. She's got my books here. You don't have to buy my books, although, <laughs> don't have to buy my books, but buy something from her. She, she go to her store and buy something. We got to keep them in business. Okay. This is my elegant book bag, which I got at Tiffany's, and that takes a lot of work to make it look like CBS. I think I'm going to start with um, just one scene that happens to be my favorite scene in the story of Arthur True Love. Arthur is an 85-year-old man whose wife died recently, and he goes every day to have lunch with her at the cemetery and to visit her. I would like to point out that I began writing this book long before the story of, or the, Uva. What's the name of that book? It's Uva, but it's but what's the whole title? A man called Uva. For for the people who say, well, she just took that idea. No, no. I wrote it first, the old man and the cat part. Anyway, Arthur is an old man, and he does live with a cat named Gordon. And his next door neighbor is named Lucille. She's a kind of cantankerous woman, but you like her anyway. She's 83, and they often sit out on the porch and, and talk. And Lucille has sustained a, a loss, and she's kind of down in the dumps. So this is a conversation that they have in their rocking chairs. Lucille says, it's so embarrassing to be useless. Why, you're not useless, Arthur says. Yes, I am. You're just going through a hard time. Yes, I am, but also I am useless. I do nothing. I realized this was happening some time ago, everything falling off, but I may do. I had church, I read books in the paper, I had my garden, but all the lights are off now, and I really don't want to live anymore, Arthur. What's left for me now? I am useless, and so are you. Arthur straightens in his chair, indignant. I'm not useless. You are too. All you do is go and visit your wife at the graveyard every day. That's all you do. Well, first of all, I don't think it's useless to visit Nola. It is my great pleasure and honor to go to the resting place of the finest woman I ever knew and think about the boundless glory of my life with her. Okay, I'm sorry I said that. I know how you feel about Nola. I know how much it means to you to go and visit her. No, you don't, Arthur says. Nobody knows how much it means to me except maybe her. And apart from that, I am not useless. But what do you do? Arthur rocks for a while. Lucille's chair has gone still, but Arthur rocks for a while. Let me ask you something, he says finally. What? Did you ever hear anyone say they wanted to be a writer? Yes, I've heard lots of people say that. He stops his rocking to look over at her. But what we need are readers, right? Where would writers be without readers? Who are they going to write for? And actors, what are they without an audience? Actors, painters, dancers, comedians, even just ordinary people doing ordinary things, what are they without an audience of some sort? See, that's what I do. I am the audience. I am the witness. I am the great appreciator. That's what I do. And that's all I want to do. I worked for a lot of years. I did a lot of things for a lot of years. Now, well, here I am in the rocking chair, and I don't mind it, Lucille. I don't feel useless. I feel lucky. So that's um, just the brief. Oh, thank you. Um, so make someone happy. Um, I told you about it. it's uh, it's um, Facebook postings that are collected into um, a little. Uh oh, that's not the one I want. I lost. Okay. Does anyone have this book right now? Do you? 
Would you do me a favor and flip through there and find something called Dinner Party, which I lost the place of? And I'll read. Oh, I found it. No, that was just yet. that was just a test. Thank you for volunteering. Anyway, did you snort? I love that so much. I'm going to give you a microphone. <laughs> okay. How many of you just love to have dinner parties? That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Okay. Those of you who raise your hand, well, goody for you. And this is for the rest of us. I had a dinner party the other night and was a nervous wreck beforehand. Because even though I had decided to make food, I was completely comfortable with. Food is like a horse. If it senses you're nervous, it will misbehave. It's going to be retro night, I had gaily told my guests. And so I made butternut squash soup, little individual barbecue lemon meat lobes, mashed potatoes, green beans, and an apple pie. But when I checked on the baking pie, I saw the top crust separating from the bottom, and juice was running out all over the place. I thought, what the? And then realized I'd forgotten to put in the thickener. I called my friend Phyllis, whom I'd already called in a panic about how much cheese to buy for appetizers and how long to wait to serve dinner after the guests arrive. And why do people have dinner parties anyway when it makes you such a nervous wreck? And she answered her phone by saying, now what? I told her that I'd screwed up the pie and that also I didn't have a big enough tablecloth and so had covered the table with a bunch of on-point vintage tablecloths. That sounds great, she said. Really? I said. And she said, yeah. Can you come over? I said in my little voice that I use when I'm feeling sorry for myself. I wish I could, she said in her soothing, motherly voice that she uses when she wants to sound soothing and motherly. I said I'd been going to make another pie, but I didn't want to. So I decided that I would just admit to the guests that I'd made a mistake and we'd have to eat the pie with spoons. Or, I said, I would tell them it was a fancy French version of an apple pie meant to be very, very juicy and eaten with spoons. Apple pie de plus jus Napoleon. <laughs> oh, don't lie, Phyllis said. They might know you're lying. Oh, they'll definitely know I'm lying, I said. But see, that will be part of the entertainment portion of the evening. <laughs> or maybe when I serve the pie, I'll say, you know, there's a tradition in quilting where you always leave a mistake in the quilt because life isn't perfect, but it's still good. And there's a mistake in this pie, but I'm going to serve it anyway because you all are my friends and I feel safe with you. Yeah, Phyllis said. And again, I asked her to come over. And again, she said no, she does live in California after all. <laughs> and then we hung up. Well, when it was time to serve the pie, I said my little speech, and then guess what? The pie was fine. I don't know how that happened, and I choose to think it was a miracle. Um, so the follow-up, I should, I should say, too, to give credit that Phyllis designed this cover because I told her that I wanted reading these, you know, the. The um, Facebook posts are sort of like email, and I wanted it to have a mail theme, and I, I wanted it to be like, when you come home and your mailbox is stuffed with flowers. So there it is. So when we did the next one, I said, how about fireflies? So that's what she did here. Um, OK, so still happy. This is called the drive-in. We used to go a lot when I was a kid. We had a station wagon, so my dad would put the car seats down and voila, a bed for when we kids got sleepy. 
We put on our pajamas, and when dusk came, we went to the land of gravel and gently sloping hillocks and metal speakers that affixed to the rolled down windows, which allowed the mosquitoes in, but one had then to, and now, suffer for art. After we found our parking spot, we kids raced out to the playground completely unembarrassed about being in PJs because all the other kids were there in their PJs too. Cowboy pajamas, roughly pink baby doll pajamas, boys wearing their dad's t-shirts that came down to their knees, you saw it all. When the sky started darkening, the commercials would come on, interspersed with an image of a clock showing how much time was left before the show. Tangy hot pizza, the announcer would say. Ice cold Coca-Cola. It was a bid to get everyone to go to the snack bar the, where the food was both terrible and irresistible. And we hardly ever got to go, so naturally I really wanted to go. But there we kids were, running around the playground at breakneck speed, hogging the little play for, platform at the top of the slide because then you felt like king of the playground, making the teeter-totter jump, helping push the merry-go-round, difficult to do wearing slippers, and then movie time. We'd race back to the car and settle in and think, oh boy, we can stay up really late, but then we fell asleep pretty quickly. Cut to the teen years. Many of us got in free by hiding in someone's trunk. Many of us went on dates to the drive-in and we never saw much of the movie. For the boys, it was a question of how much they could get. For the girls, it was a question of how far we would let them go. I found it nerve-wracking. There you were in the middle of a great kiss and here would come the wandering hands and your antenna would go up and you would have to make difficult decisions. The boys were in paradise, and the girls were at summit conferences. One night, a guy who wanted to go farther than I wanted him to said, come on, I'm going to blow a gasket. I asked what the heck a gasket was, and that pretty much spoiled the mood. <laughs> My taste leaned toward preppy guys in high school, but the best date I ever had was with this guy I met at Steak and Shake, who was practically a gangster. He pulled into the parking lot of the SNS in a chartreuse colored sports car with barf written on the side in yellow spray paint. You can see why I was instantly attracted to him. <clears throat> I guess I liked how boldly unconventional he was driving around in jeans and a t-shirt, his blonde hair hanging in his eyes. We had one date and he took me to the drive-in. I was very disappointed when he came to pick me up because he had greased his hair back and cleaned up and was driving a different car, but never mind. Off we went to the drive-in, and he produced a six-pack, which I declined, and he did not. And then we made out the whole time, and he was and is the best kisser I ever met. I went home with lips swollen to about three times their normal size, and I never saw him again. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, I wonder what was best, going to the drive-in as a kid or as a teenager. I guess I'd have to say as a kid, the pink clouds, the set, setting sun, the notion that you could be wild on the playground and then run to the safety of a kind of home furnished with an air mattress and a light summer blanket. Your parents sitting up in the front and all you could see was the back of their heads, but you were pretty sure they were holding hands. It was a summer night, the stars shone above the big movie screen, your parents were awake, and you were asleep, and you were all together. Um, one of the things I do a lot on, on Facebook is um, put entries from my dogs, um, Gabby talks, she really does. And um, so this is, um, from Gabby at a time when um, Homer was going through a rough time. Gabby, I see that someone requested that I weigh in here amid all the Homer stuff, amid all the Homer, Homer, Homer stuff. Me, someone did say they'd like to hear from you. Would you like to say something? Gabby, let me sit at your desk. I've been practicing typing. Me, okay. I stand beside the computer. 
Gabby, looking up at me. What? Me. What? Gabby, don't watch. Go and make a peanut butter and jelly and grape jelly sandwich like you were just fantasizing. Me, how do you know I was fantasizing about that? Gabby, oh man, what you don't know about what we dogs know. But run along, let me talk to the people. Me, okay, but don't hurt my computer. Gabby, have I ever hurt your computer? Me, no, but you've never typed on it. Gabby, true, but run along. Hi, everybody. First of all, let me say that I'm so honored that someone missed hearing from me as I have very much missed talking to you. The most exciting thing going on here is that I get to have hamburger mixed in with my kibble lately. I don't know how long it will last and I don't want to jinx anything, so enough said. <laughs> the other exciting thing is that the heat has broken so I can lie in the backyard and wait for the dogs on the other side of the fence to come out. We have play fights and our owners have heart attacks and yell and call us back, but we're just fun and they get so worked up. Gabby, come here. No fighting with those dogs. Kind of fun. Also, I've been spending time with my pal Homer. We lie in the same room and sometimes I gave him, give him a little lick when I pass by him. I know my roommates, Elizabeth and Bill, get very sad about him sometimes, but that's because they forget to be philosophers. Also, they forget to be present in the moment, which is something dogs are great at. All those people who write books about being in the moment, they could help people a lot more by saying one thing, get a dog. We are natural being in the momenters. Accidentally step on our tail and what do we do? Yelp, and then wag our tail because we love you and we have moved on and so on. Other news, though not exciting, is that I got groomed the other day. I hate getting groomed. I do not like the hair dryer and I do not like my skirts puffed up like a poodle and I do not like to get sprayed with her dopey perfume and I hate those neckerchiefs. I am more of a classic dresser than that. If I wore clothes, it would be Chanel. If you want to put something around my neck, make it a double strand of pearls. Whew, this typing has worn me out. I do hunt and peck, you know. And speaking of hunting, I'm going out to the backyard where the peonies are blooming and iris are coming up and there's a lot of lavender. I can hardly decide what to pee on. Oh, maybe you don't know, I pee like a boy sometimes. I learned it from Homer. Also, I learned and am learning courage and fortitude and an immense, immense love that glows in the dark. Homer is the furry Buddha. I am his grateful disciple. I guess everyone in this house is, except for the parakeet, who never thinks of anything but when he'll get his next fix of cilantro. Um, okay. Um, we are going to have some questions after this. So um, if you want to uh, think about what you want to ask, if anything, I'm happy to take any questions, including about recipes. <laughs> it, I might know the answer. Um, I think I, I'm going to, Faye, would you like a sneak preview of um, Night of Miracles? What are you going to say? No. I mean, it would be, be so embarrassing for me. Anyway, okay. This is, <laughs> this is, uh, this is pretty short. And um, this is Lucille, who's the, the character you heard about in uh, when I read from Arthur True Love. Again, uh, a little cranky, definitely opinionated and blunt, but lovable anyway. After she has dried and put away her supper dishes, Lucille Howard goes out onto her front porch to stand with her hands on her hips, taking in a better view of the night sky. From the kitchen window, the stars were so clear they looked like diamond. Out here, it's even more glorious. As a child, Lucille thought stars were diamonds and that if only she prayed in the right way, the cigar box she kept under her bed would be filled with them some morning and she could make a necklace of them. Never happened. Well, of course it never happened. Stars are not diamonds. They're suns, really, just balls of gas. 
If there's one thing Lucille hates, it's how science has to rain on Whimsy's parade. Rainbows, not a gift from leprechauns offering pots of gold, but only a trick of refraction. A blue sky, not a miles wide painting done by a heavenly hand, but molecules scattering light. Still, when Lucille sees the stars strewn across the sky on a light night tonight, they're diamonds, and she thinks they might end up under her bed yet. Maybe she'll put a box back under there. Tradition, whimsy, hope. Magical thinking, she knows it's magical thinking, and she knows too that she's more prone to it now than she ever was. But what fun to imagine kneeling down to lift, lift the dust truffle and just check. And there they are, at last, diamonds in a box, shining so hard they light up the surprised oval of her face. It's cold enough for a jacket, this being the first of October, but Lucille is still in the habit of summer, the roses still blooming, and so has neglected to put one on. It feels like too much work to go back in and get one. So she settles into a rocking chair, wraps her arms around herself, and moves vigorously back and forth. She gives herself a challenge. She'll stay out here until it feels like her teeth might chatter before she goes inside. Then she'll draw a bath and have a soak and Epsom salts. One thing she's grateful for are the grab bars she's had installed, though even with them, Getting herself down into the tub is a Herculean task that reminds her a bit of elephants lowering themselves onto tiny stools the way they used to have to do in the circus. She's glad no one could see her the way she grunts and huffs and puffs. Lord, they would say, why don't you switch to showers? You're 88. True, but mostly she feels like she's 68. When she was 68, she felt like she was 48. And so, Although she knows the logic is off, she tells everyone she feels like 48. Lucille will not give up her baths, no. In the tub, she is what she thinks being stoned must be like. She enjoys a feeling of timelessness and wide content, a floaty perfume detachment. After her bath, she'll read her Maeve Binchy book and then she'll go to sleep. The neighbor is coming out to walk his dog Lucille has nothing against dogs, but that one is the ugliest thing she's ever seen. An ancient mid-sized gray mutt who looks like he needs a shave. Bugged out eyes like a pug, a bit bow-legged, a tail that looks more like Eeyore's than a dog's, and his name, Henry. Now why in the world would you give a dog that looks like that a name befitting a king? Hello, Lucille, the man calls over. Hello, Jason, Lucille answers, though she muffles the name a bit. Is it Jason, or is it Jeremy, or Jeffrey? It's a little past the point where she can ask. The neighbors have been there for almost a year. The J person, his wife, Abby, and their 10-year-old son, whose name is, well, for heaven's sake, starts with an L, Liam, Leroy, Lester, she closes her eyes to concentrate. Lincoln, that's it. Another strange name, if you ask her. What's become of Spot and Rex and Champ for dogs? What's become of Mary and Sally and Billy for children? She has kept her eyes closed and is startled now by the sound of footsteps, Jay and his dog coming up onto her porch. She cries out and leaps to her feet. Sorry, the man says, did I scare you? Yes, I'm sorry, it's all right. She pulls her hand down from where it had flown up onto her chest. I just wanted to ask you if you'd be free to come to our house for dinner tomorrow night. Abby's been meaning to ask you forever, but we, tomorrow night, what time? <laughs> Seven? Seven? How can your son wait that long to eat? Six, the man says, smiling. That's better, she says. I'll bring dessert. She has some cake left over from the last class she taught. Her baking classes are getting so popular that she recently put an ad in the local paper to hire some help. The man turns around. Um, we don't, I hope this doesn't offend you, but we don't eat dessert. 
Lucille cannot think of one thing to say, but finally manages a stiff, I see. And here is a bit of a miracle right now, because what she really, really thought she'd say is, never mind then, I don't want to come. <laughs> They're probably vegans. They'll probably have a square loaf of some brownish mass on an ugly pottery platter and a bunch of vegetables so barely cooked they're next to raw. Lucille will put a pot pie in her oven before she goes over so she can eat when she gets home. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, anybody? Have any questions they'd like to ask? Yes. What was the impetus for your for the entertainment book? Yeah. You mean which entertainment book? Not family traditions. No. No. Uh, I have it at home. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we the holidays and you tell. Oh yeah, that's family traditions. Yeah, that's family traditions. Um, well, uh, at the time, it was 1993, I think, or 92, and I had been writing for magazines for a while. Um, I had a column in Parents Magazine and in New Woman Magazine. And um, the, there is a book developer who called Parents Magazine and said, I, I have a publisher, and I have a plan for the book I want written, and I need a good writer. And they said, oh, Elizabeth Berg. So she called me. And she said, I, I'm doing a book on family traditions, and I'd like you to write it. And I said, can't do it. I don't have any. And she said, yes, you do. And, and, and then I got very nervous about writing a book and having a Library of Congress number and all that stuff. And, um, but I, I was persuaded that at last I would have a, a real book, so I agreed to write it. And so it was the first real book. When I got the books, um, I, I'll contrast this to these days when, you know, when you publish a book, you get some free copies from your publisher. And these days when they come, I say, oh, the books are here, and I'm kind of glad to see them, but they, you know, they're in the hall for a few days. When that book came, the first one, I was so excited. I took them out immediately. I didn't know what to do with them, so I took them for a ride in the car. <laughs> And then I went over, I was living in Newton at the time, and I went over to the library and I said, do you want one? <laughs> and they said, yeah, all right, we'll take one. <laughs> so that, that was a very big deal. Yeah. I still use the recipe in there for hard boiled eggs. It's a good ah, one. <laughs> I use the one for biscuits. Yeah? Is there a biscuits recipe in there? I have to go back and find it. I'm dying to find a good, is it good? <laughs> all right, there you go. Any other questions? Yeah. How did you uh, get Mr. Trulove? Arthur Trulove. Um, I was on book tour in the South, and I rode the bus, because I like to ride buses. And the driver's name was Trulove Moses. And I said, is that your real name? And he said, yep. And I said, can I use it in a book sometime? And he said, yeah. So um, it was going to be called True Love Moses, the name of the book, and then it morphed into something else, the story of Arthur True Love. His real name is Arthur, and he is given the nickname True Love by someone else in the book who is just knocked out by his great love for not only his wife, but the world. Yeah. And, and so um, when I started writing it, it was because I had that name in mind. And I, I guess I wrote about 15, 20 pages, and then I got another idea. It's unusual for that to happen for me. Usually I write a book straight through, but I got an idea to write about um, something else. That subject was, was really dark, and I was finding that I was coming into my office every day and feeling like, oh gosh, oh, I gotta go back to this dark place. The world is a little tense right now, and I didn't want to add on to it. I wanted to be someplace where people were kind to one another, where you could depend on your neighbor, where you felt good about life, where you had a lot of hope, where you didn't back away from the things that happened to all of us, but you transcended those things. I, I wanted to be in that place, so I made it up. 
And um, it was such a pleasure writing that book. I, I, I just tore through it. And um, after it was over, I, I missed it. So I wrote another one, which is what you heard from. I turned that in. It'll be out in November. And then I wrote another one. <laughs> so there'll be three in the, yeah, there'll be three in the series. The third one is called The Confession Club. And, and that will be out the November after the, this coming November. So it's been, it's been so highly therapeutic for me to write about these people. And it's been also therapeutic for me to see the response to it. I think that we are all longing for that kind of relief from literature, from music, from art, from our relationships with other people. So um, I'm glad to be in Mason, Missouri. Yeah. Did you know where you were going with Arthur? Did you know where you were going with Arthur when you started? Did you know? the other characters he was going to be involved with, or did they evolve as Arthur's story? It, the latter. Um, I don't plot when I write. I, I, one of the things that keeps me interested in writing is going down to see what's going to happen next. And I think that somewhere, in so, for writers who work in the way that I do, <clears throat> there's something inside that knows, but it's not conscious. So you write toward whatever that that internal thing is that leads you there. And the pieces kind of put themselves into place. I often describe it as a, a Polaroid camera. Remember the old Polaroid cameras? It would come out and you couldn't see anything and then the image would rise up gradually. So that's how it is for me writing a book. At first, things are a little tentative. I don't quite know the characters. I don't know what's going to happen. But um, he was at the cemetery and Maddie appeared. I, he just saw this young girl who was, you know, goth type, very different from anyone he's ever known. So that seemed interesting to me, the kind of relationship that might form between the two of them. Did your cemetery scenes come from your walking around? Did you see? I uh, love cemeteries. So we, Bill and I were walking in one last night. We had a nice dinner, and I said, hey, Bill, let's go walk in the cemetery, because I'm a fun girl. <laughs> and um, I, I really love them. I, I feel that, um, well, obviously, they, they make you happy that you're alive, you know, among all these people who are not. But more than that, it's all the stories there. It's all the lives lived, and who were these people? And, what, what did they do and what did they hope for? And, <clears throat> and you see things left at, on the grave. Um, sometimes it's stones, sometimes it's a Gumby, you know. So it, it's all different things and I, I find it very moving. It's beautifully done. Thank you. Hi. Having been a dog lover my whole life, um, I love the entries you had um, about Homer and Facebook, especially towards the end. I'm sorry to ask this sad question, but whenever I read them, I would just sob. Um, are they included in one of the Still Happy books? Yeah. The, the, this, the book of Homer um, has all the entries about him, including when he was quite alive and well. And you know, that business about crying. Um, I read this book um, for tape and I could not stop sobbing when I got to that part and I kept saying, okay, stop, I'll get myself together. And finally I decided, why am I trying to hide this? Because really it's a tribute to him, how much he meant to, to me and to Bill. So I, I think for those of us who are dog lovers, we, we take it pretty hard, but it's also a very beautiful thing to take care of an old dog. Yeah. Really I beautiful. loved how it, there was one thing that you wrote that you just got right down on the floor with him. Yeah. And talked to him and yeah. how he talked back. And, yeah. And just kind of the same thing, being in the moment with him and kind of appreciating him. And yeah. so I thought, I was so glad to hear this today that you had put those in a book. I didn't realize that until yeah. now. So I said, oh, good, I'll go back and read them and cry and, all over again. And, <laughs> oh, there are so many pictures of him, too. I'll see if I can oh, find good. one here big enough to show you. But he was such a beautiful dog. And um, as you may know, I got him as a rescue. And he was Satan himself. <laughs> he was a horrible. He bit children. I mean, I, well, anyway, you can see, anybody who wants to see pictures of Homer, it's, it's in this book out there. He, um, I, 
I had a golden mix who, who died, and I wanted another dog right away, so I got a puppy who wasn't going to be ready, and I can't stand not having a dog, so I looked in the newspaper just to see, and there was a year-old dog. I called the guy, and he said, oh, yeah, he's great. It's just that we don't have time for him. And um, so I went to look at him, and when I got there, um, the, the owner was not there yet, there was a basement, you know, those slide out doors where you can walk outside so I could see in, and I saw the dog, and he was in a tiny crate. He couldn't stand up. He couldn't turn around. I, I just saw his face, and I could see he was wagging his tail, and I said, I'm getting you out of there. <laughs> and whether, whether, he, whether I ended up keeping it, that dog was not staying there. So um, I brought him home, and it was a very busy time for Bill and he was all dressed up in his good suit and Homer came flying down the stairs and jumped all over him and I kept saying, he's a good dog, he's a good dog, he'll be fine. But um, I was putting away laundry very soon after I got him and he came up and bit me in the behind and he was not trustworthy around children. He would get these periods of dog insanity where you just couldn't reach him. He would go nuts, he'd be burying his teeth and, and he was a golden of all things. So imagine what kind of treatment he had that made him that way. But um, I, could, I called the Golden Rescue League and I said, I, I can't handle him. I've had dogs all my life. I'm really good at training. I can't handle him. And they said, we don't want him. <laughs> we can't take a dog that bites. So I kept him and it took a little while, but he turned into the best dog ever. He was just great and he was really intelligent and you would swear that he was communicating with you in the time that you're referencing when I lay on the floor with him one of many times I might add it's as though he was saying don't be upset about this this is the great cycle of life and I am so happy I got to be with you and you're so happy about it's okay and um, you know I'd be saying no it isn't it isn't <laughs> but um, yeah um, he was yeah. probably testing you when you first got him and he bit you. He was thinking, all right. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see how dedicated you are. Yeah, yeah. And he, um, you know, we have a, another dog, Gabby, who's a, a golden mix, another rescue. And she's not, I hope she wouldn't mind my telling you, she's not on the same plane as Homer intellectually. For example, if I say, Gabby, where's Bill? She goes, <laughs> So um, it's, it's a pleasure of another sort, but she's very beautiful and sweet. And my, my grandchildren are here, they will attest to that. My beautiful daughter, Julie, who I'll embarrass now. My, what's our relationship, BJ? BJ is Julie's mother-in-law. What's our relationship? I'm your mother There you go, that's why I don't remember it. Yeah, but they'll, they, they all know Gabby, yeah. A year? Love? <clears throat> Excuse me, absolutely love. Yeah. About a year, I think. Yeah. Yeah. A long time. And it, and it, it wasn't easy. I mean, it, you know, I, I could... I couldn't trust that he would invite someone, so when I took him for walks, I had to rein him in, and I, I would take him to outdoor cafes, and he, you know, people would say, oh, and I'd say, N you know, especially children, don't, don't. Did you hustle at all? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. When I took him out, finally, I did do that. Yeah. But he just came out of it. He was great. Yeah. He, and, he, and he was 14. I got him when he was one. So we had him a long time. Yes, sir. Was it uh, much of a struggle to write about a goth teenager? I mean, you wrote it so well that the reader cares about her just as much as... Yeah, um, I would have to say no, really. Um, I think that one of the things that, that I do, most writers do, and a lot of people do, is really wonder about other people's lives. You know, you see someone who looks interesting, and you start imagining what it feels like to be that person. So if you want to write authentic characters, you have to become that character for that moment when you're writing them, <clears throat> excuse me, to the extent that you can. So um, yeah, I, I, I think that 
probably all of us can relate to those turbulent teenage years when you just sort of despise yourself and where she happens to be someone who's bullied in school. And I, I wanted to look at that, too, because I, I really worry about kids that that happens to. Uh, so um, she had a great deal of resilience, that character, but not everyone does. <clears throat> I gotta have a little vodka here. Excuse me. So you continue with <clears throat> Lucille. Does Maddie get worked into some of your future yeah. books? Yeah. Maddie, Maddie is in Night of Miracles and she's in the Confession Club a lot. Yeah. I, uh, we're not going to talk about that because not everybody's read Arthur. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Can you tell me the name? I missed the name of the books. Uh, the Drive-In Story and Lucille. What are the name of the books that you read from? Drive-In. Drive the Drive-In is in um, Still Happy. Still Happy. Uh -huh. Okay. And the Lucille. And Lucille is in the story of Arthur True Love, which oh, okay. is yes. yeah, okay. which is this yeah. one, and and that one's for sale. But the one that she's also in will will not be out until November. Okay, I was uh, thinking about the the one in the future because I've read Arthur True Love. Okay. In fact, when I finished it, I turned around and opened the. Oh, you again. did? Oh, I loved, loved, Thank you loved very it. much. Thank you. Could you come on all the rest of the tour <laughs> stuff? <and laughs> say that, and that would be great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, we'll I make did, it comfortable for you. I've never done that with a book before. Oh, wow. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, it, here's, um, if you want, um, I bet you could pre-order Night of Miracles from you. Could they do that? No? Maybe? Yes? Okay. We got a <laughs> nod there. Okay. Yes. How has your nursing or how did your nursing career influence your writing? Absolutely. I, I still feel like I'm working as a nurse. I still feel that what I want to do when I write is comfort people. And um, also when I was a nurse, I was very much interested in the lives of the people for whom I cared. It wasn't, I wasn't um, that much interested in the, in the technical part. I have a very good friend I've had for, for ever since 1974. We were nurses together, and she was a technical wonder. She knew how to do everything. Um, and I, I yelled at her about this, so I'm okay to tell you. But what she did not have was that interest in in their lives and also in empowering them because she was so good at what she did that when she would teach um, discharge planning, um, she would do the dressing. You know, the idea is the patient's going home, someone else will have to do the dressing change. So one time the husband was there and she was trying to teach him to do the dressing and <laughs> she just grabbed it away from him and, and you know, then he didn't know how to do it. So I was, I was very interested in who these people were and how they lived their lives. And that's what you do as a writer, too, is look inside other people's lives. Um, but yeah, I, I learned a lot from nursing. And one of the things was, the first thing they taught us was to have unconditional positive regard for every patient for whom we cared for. So that meant that you left your judgment at the door. You, you just walked in and this was a, a person who behaved the way that they did for reasons of their own. And your job was not to make decisions about whether that was good or bad. That was a really good lesson, which I wish I did better at. But it was a very good lesson to learn. The other thing was, in looking at a patient, we were taught the cephalocaudal approach, which is head to toe. So when you walk into a patient's room, you don't just look at this circumscribed oval of face, you look at the whole body. And if you look around this room now, if you look at the way people are sitting or what they're doing with their feet or their hands, they might get embarrassed if you look at them, Never mind. But next time you're at an airport gate waiting for the flight that never gets there, just kind of quietly look around and see what you can tell about the way someone is 
holding their shoulders or their hands. So that gives you a lot of information about someone, a head-to-toe analysis. So um, the, other, the other important thing we learned was um, just because the patient in room 407 has terminal cancer and is really in pain all the time, it doesn't diminish the pain of the person next door who had a simple cholecystectomy. So we all have our, our burdens, and some may be tougher than others, but compassion goes a long way for everybody. So yeah, it was, it was I, I met someone um, who ran the agency when I worked as a visiting nurse, and she announced herself yesterday, and I thought, oh, I hope I didn't do anything terrible with that agency, but she was very nice, so I think it was okay. Curse. I'm a nurse. It's kind of I do the same thing, but I look at people, and it's a kind of a curse because I think, ooh, their color's a little off. I know they've got a cardiac <laughs> thing going on. It's a curse. It really is. <laughs> and it's come true a couple of times where I've mentioned to people that I know, gee, is your friend okay? And yeah, you find out they're not. And, you know, yeah, so, yeah. But I that came through in the yearbook range of motion. Mm -hmm. um, just your that nurturing by the nurses and. Um, I don't know if anyone's read that, but it's one where the husband's in a coma. Is it the husband in a coma? I'm sorry? Is that range of motion where the husband's in the coma? Yeah. Yeah. That's and range of motion. That was the... just the most beautifully written book. But my question was that I, the very first book I read that was written by you was called Talk Before Sleep. Mm -hmm. And I've never cried or laughed so hard as I did when I read that book. It was just just this release of emotions, and I just wondered, I mean, in the way that you express the love between those friends, it, it just kind of blew me away. Um, but was there, I mean, did you have a friend like that? Yeah, um, I, I lost a friend to breast cancer. She was 44 years old, a really vibrant personality. Um, and I never intended to write about that experience. But when everything was over, what I took away from it was immense sorrow, of course. I missed her a lot. I still miss her. But I saw the value of female friendship. I saw what women do for each other. And I remember I, I went on NPR and talked to Susan Stamberg, and, and she was talking about that, and, and she was kind of asking for a little more about that. And I said, well, um, I think women do it better, you know, the caretaking. And I got so much heat from that. I got, I got a lot of blowback from um, people who said men do it really well too. And I said, no, they don't. <laughs> Not the same. Anyway, yeah. Yes. So one of my favorites is Home Safe, and I didn't realize your daughter's here. But when in that book, when she's saying, Mom, Mom. Mom, I was wondering. That's that her sister who did that. <laughs> mom, 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 mom. That was just so funny. And yeah. I just love that book. I've read it twice. Thank you. I, that mom, mom, your voice and your characters <laughs> just come right up. Did anybody else have da daughters or children who did? Mom, 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 mom. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, see? Yeah. There you go. Oh. <laughs> yes. I could not see the child, but the mother was on the deck. The child was down below, and the kid is yelling, Ma, Ma, Ma. <laughs> and she says, over the deck, she said, I'm not your mother right now. <laughs> <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Okay, yes. I'm just curious. Um, you wrote a book that I can't remember the name of historical fiction about a famous. George Sand? Yes. It's called how The Dream you, Lover. How did you do that? And would you do something like that again? I know it was a Probably would not do something like that again because it was really hard. <laughs> um, at the same time, I love doing it because I loved reading all the books that I did to write it. The, the um, biography of Chopin, of, of um, reading about all the other authors with whom she hung out, and her immense autobiography, um, History of My Life. Uh, it was hard, but it was. But I'm very proud of it. Um, but I, I think I'm, in the end, what interests me most are the smaller moments and ordinary people more than um, the famous people. So I'll probably stick to that to the end of my days. I want to thank every single one of you for coming. Thank you so much. Oh, if if you want um, if you want a book sign, I'll be in the uh, in the mob room uh, with the books. So, thanks again. <laughs>